praising God, and uh, that's what we're going to continue to do is praise God. Go to Acts 2. We'll start out there for a little while, and then we'll go over to Colossians 3 and uh, spend a little time um, just praising God and another piece and part of what, we, uh, what we've uh, decided to do together and uh, usually this time of the year, which is to remember what God has done, remember uh, Him, celebrate Him, and uh, recognize and declare uh, His glory and uh, say, praise you, Lord, we praise you. And uh, last week, uh, as you can see up on the screen there, uh, last Sunday we looked at He is doing it. And when I came together with you as, uh, as pastor uh, back months ago, and I said, hey, we're, we, we'd love to see God kind of restore some things, and most of all, restore from the inside out as only the Lord can do. And last Sunday, we looked at all the areas in which the Lord has been restoring and continues to restore things. He is doing it. He's restoring the body principle in his local church. And uh, it's good to follow along with what God says to do. And, and then on the other side of it, it's great to see God do what he said he was going to do. And, and uh, guess what? He's always going to do what he said he's going to do, even despite whether or not we're going to do what we ought to do. The interesting part about it is that the walk with the Lord, the victorious Christian life, the, the restored, reconciled life is so much sweeter in that place when we just say, okay, Lord, I'm going to praise you. You are doing what you're going to do, and I can see you're doing it, and you're putting some lives back together, and you want to put more lives back together, and you want to restore relationship. And that's one of the sweetest things of our study in 2 Samuel, the beginning of the year, the first few months, is there's nothing beyond his grace. And no matter how things went with David as the king of Israel, he restored personal relationship back all the time, God restored it back with him. When David came to him and he repented and he made things right and he wrote some of the most beautiful words, over 70 psalms that he wrote in reflection of his relationship with God. And many of his psalms, by the way, he wrote had a lot to do with praise, with thanksgiving, with repentance, with uh, being broken before the Lord and restored the joy of my salvation, of course, out of Psalm 51, Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. Some of the very best words that you and I can use in our time where we're thinking, this is impossible. Life is so tough. Oh, I don't know, God, I I've done so much against you. There's no way. And he says, no, 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 no. Put some praise on your lips. Thank me for who I am. Be reminded that I'm your father in the name of Jesus and I'll restore you back to that beautiful fellowship. You have not lost your sonhood. You have not lost your heirhood. When you got saved, you were sealed to the day of redemption. But tell me this. Anybody who would ever, ever be able to say, I testify that God the Father has ever rejected you when you came to him to make things right. If you can tell me that, sorry, I'm going to call you a liar. Because that's not what God does. If you come to him on his terms. The way he says, broken and contrite heart, broken and contrite spirit. God says, come to me, all ye that are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's saying, just come to me, and I will restore things, and I'll put things back together. And I've seen God doing that, and God continues to do that. Sicknesses are going to come and go. Life is going to be tough. You might as well live it loving Jesus. You might as well do it going through the tribulations of this life favoring Jesus. You might as well go through it seeking the way Jesus did it because there's no one that ever walked the face of the earth going through more trial, testing, tribulation, and heartache. And yet, the Bible tells us in Hebrews, it was his joy that he went to the cross. It was his joy that he died for you and for me to be the perfect sacrifice and fulfill his Father's will when he came to this earth. Remember that this morning as we give thanks. We're going to give thanks this morning. Let's give thanks to the Lord this morning. Where does that come from? It comes from the Bible. And so Acts chapter number 2, again, you're going to hear a lot about this in December. I'm going to be able to, uh, I, if God would allow, to, to really just lay out some things for you in the month of December on what things are going to look like at First Bible as we move on and continue to complete the assignment that God's called us over the next hundred years. 
or until the rapture. So there we go. Here we go. Acts 2. Lots of things have gone on. People have gotten saved, baptized. They're, they're cranking. The early, very earliest raw form of church starts. And in verse 46 it says, And they, who? Well, the 3,000 souls back at 41 and 42 and 43. And, and, they continued. They, can't, they, they continued to just follow after God. It says, verse number 46, They continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking a bread from, the ho from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. I say often when I read this passage, it just that part just gets me. Gladness and singleness of heart. What a sweet way to hang out. It doesn't matter. Last night we had the uh, investors, um, well, they had it. They invited me, which was pretty awesome. And I was honored to be part of the investors' Thanksgiving dinner. And Doc, it was great. It was just a, such a good time. And... Uh, uh, there's so much to be said for what God has done and to give thanks for and to see that God's still doing it in that little ministry, a little tiny piece of first Bible, a little tiny piece of the importance of the infrastructure, spiritually speaking, for what God's doing. And guess what? They were in gladness and singleness of heart last night. I think it had a lot to do with the turkey being very good. Yes, the gravy was good, the, the, the stuffing, the mashed potatoes, gosh. I only had one plate of food last night. And so I got to say right up there, give thanks. And I did I was going to go get some dessert. There's some pumpkin pies out there. Oh my goodness. But it was gladness and singleness of heart. Why? Because it was in the name of Jesus. And it was by the spirit of the Lord that people were to gather together. There was a singleness of heart. I love that. Only God can give you a singleness of heart. He's the only one that can give you a true gladness of heart. Things will fleet and come, but blessed is the man is God's way. God's got the assignment to bless you, and he will bless you. He will do it through other people, which is beautiful. But also, sometimes when you're all by yourself out on an island and you think of the only person and you just call it to God and say, thank you, God, he will put that gladness in your heart and he will give you that singleness with him just as they had gladness and singleness of heart together. And then it says, verse 47, two simple words, praising God. Praising God. And also, too, by the way, they had favor with all the people. So that means that God had given them such sweet grace, such a handoff. Here, let me give you some favor. Let me give you some more favor. And then let me give you some more favor. And they had favor with all the people that they were hanging out with around them. Because it says, again, in verse number 46, that they were in the temple, hanging out at the temple. Not for the Jewish rituals that they used to be, but getting together by the preaching and teaching of the word of God that was going on with the apostles. And, of course, verse 47, and the Lord added to the church daily as should be saved. Go to Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians 3. So we're going to praise God by giving thanks today. Praising God to me is a, is a simple statement that oftentimes we forget. Uh, guess what? We have to center up on who's the one that gets the credit for things. And we ought to say in the home or in the job or in the team or the workplace or the school or wherever it is, hey, I need to praise the person who's unifying things together. I need to give praise to the person who's doing the work that needs to be done, and then I need to jump in on it. And that's really what we're looking at here. Because Paul the Apostle, in the letter at Coloss that he's uh, writing to the church at Colossae, and these Colossian people, we're studying it, by the way, on Wednesday nights. We won't be, of course, together this Wednesday because of Thanksgiving, but we got three more uh, Wednesdays to go. And where I'm looking at here is that we're using just chapter number three today and a few verses like we did last week, but it points to the Lord Jesus Christ. It points to the unifying one. We need to be reminded that there's one big thing that's going on here all the time with all the stuff that's moving and doing and when we get together on Sunday is that God is behind all of this. God is in the center of all of this. The Lord Jesus Christ is preeminent over all things. And so when we give thanks today, what I want to do is, as I've done many times, is is just point out some things that maybe you're not aware of. Make you aware so you can say, well, if God's behind all of this, then 
who is behind all of us doing this that we can see? Well, you look around and you say, wow, there's a, uh, maybe uh, 60, 70, 80 people in the auditorium. There's another 10 or 15 people in the Sunday groups. There's some, some youth uh, ministry kids, junior high and high school there. There's a bunch of children people in there. A bunch of children people over there. There's people in the coffee house. There's people welcoming people. There's people on uh, ushers. There's a lot of things going on. So when we have worship service, how does it even happen? Well, there's people that spend time in prayer. There's people that spend time before they come up on the stage. They, they pray and they get behind their instruments and they're, they're saying, Lord, use me. And there's a lot of things that go into that. And so we thank them. Let's give thanks to the Lord for those that do some singing and, and they do a lot of things to prepare. There's a lot that goes into the teaching of the Word of God, the preaching of the Word of God. And as I said last night to the group of investors, Hey, listen, we've got good material here. Get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit of God do some teaching for us. And for you and me to say, who's the one unifying it all? Who's the one that's behind it? Well, it's the Lord. But there's people in the Lord that are behind things as well. So we have a worship service in here. We have the Lord's Supper. Someone prepared the Lord's Supper to make sure that it was ready. It's all set for us to have it at the end of service. And these people that are behind it, Again, the Lord is behind everything. The presentations ministry where people make sure the lights are running right and the, and the cameras are running right and the, the, um, the computers upstairs and the soundboard back there. Uh, you usually pay attention to the sound people when something goes wrong, don't you? Yeah, yeah, right? Ed, 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 what are you, Ed, uh, I'll be nice in second service, Ed. You, you're, 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 <laughs> but... Ed and, and Mike and, and Debbie and the whole crew that's upstairs. Rachel's up there and, and uh, Christine, my daughter, helps out a little bit. And, of course, we have uh, put a lot of things in place. Why? Just so that we can get all the distractions out of the way and allow Jesus Christ to be preeminent in this crazy United States of America. Do the same thing in Zambia with less cameras and less, just get everything out of the way. And let's let God be God and let God do the work. And so we go to a little bit of trouble on purpose. And the support personnel around here, like Ed, who's been doing it for 100 years, and, and Debbie and Rick, they say, hey, we love doing this to serve the Lord. We know the Lord's in the middle of it all. The people that sing and the people that play instruments, all that, it's for the glory of God. So we give thanks to them. The coffee house. I joke often, the coffee doesn't just brew itself, though we think it might. People come in, they brew coffee, but even when we didn't have the coffee house open, it's just a great place of fellowship. And there's a place where people can get out there and hang out, but of course we do have some coffee out there. And all of you have, have noticed that we've been brewing coffee for a few weeks. I thank the Lord for the people that do that. You know, it's a thankless job to clean things up, but people clean things up. And people do all that needs to be done in our beautiful lobby area, the coffee house area. We have a welcome team that welcomes you if there's anything that you have a need for. Just to have a, a welcome face and, and, and a good, sweet, godly greeting. And the ushers that do all that they do and how they hang out in the lobby. And, and uh, actually, uh, as I've said before, that this, this is a neat picture. There's actually people standing there. You just can't see them. That's part of that virtual thing, okay? Just kidding. But there's people always out in the lobby ready to greet you and meet whatever needs the ushers. Um, I don't know. He's standing to post right there. I'm a little bit scared. <laughs> I don't know. There's a little bulge in the side. I don't know. Is that a Glock or a 9 millimeter? Uh, <laughs> of course, these guys got just done with the donuts, and then they put the masks on. <laughs> So you can't see the Lamars that's on their faces, you know. I thank the Lord for those guys and gals out there that they just take care of things and make sure I have a sense of comfort knowing everything's going to be all right. Yeah, let's give thanks. And then, of course, we have our children's ministry, our faith place friends and travelers, and, of course, the little ones in there. Um, you can see by this picture that the kids are in self-care. We don't have any adults. <laughs> Uh, anymore. Uh, they're just by themselves. They do whatever they want and there's no problem. Larry, new children's ministry. Just do whatever you want. No, we've got really, really sweet people that are taking care of these children. One of the sweetest places you can ever serve God's family. You say, do you need any help? Well, God, if God told you that means that you're supposed to. 
And if you're not listened to, you say, okay, thank you, God. You call the office. So I don't know how to get in. All you need to do is make one phone call. Send a text. I'd love to find out about the children's ministry. Get a hold of Pam. You'll be able to be partnering with all these women and men who desire to teach children the Bible. They're teaching them the Bible at one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old. Every age they teach, they learn the Bible. They learn about Jesus Christ. They can learn at any age. I learned that from a wise old sage and his wife years ago. They can learn about Jesus Christ. And I thank God that my children had a chance to go to church all their lives and learn about Jesus Christ. Two different churches, that's all we've ever been in. And they've learned about Christ. And they all came to know Christ through so many incredible people's lives teaching the Bible. The Faith Place Travelers, which is the elementary side, and thank you for the Dawsons and both of them, thank you for Elena, different people that work in there, the Pittmans, uh, the, the Snows, uh, of course, the Thomases and, and Larry. And um, I'm just so thankful. We, as a team, as a group, most of all, as the congregation of the Lord, and what the Bible says that we're a congregation, an ecclesia, a set out assembly of people that believe. We need to be thankful for what we have, the youth ministry, all the servant team. You'll see them just in pictures, and it's not rehearsed. They're spending time. They might get an, uh, 60, 65, 70 minutes for just a touch with somebody, just a quick touch, just to hang out. Of course, some of them do like to pose, like your daughter. You know, they like to, but they have a great time together. Just that quick touch with the Lord, learning about Christ. And guess what? It might lead to another contact and another connection. And then learning the Bible, learning about the Lord, being discipled at a young age. And what a team of servants that God has given us. I think that the adults are bigger hams for the photography than the kids are. But they have a sweet time in there. I thank the Lord for the youth ministry people for 20-something years. And presently, thank you, Josh Bennett. He's a wonderful youth pastor, and he's doing a great job. He's got a great team with his wife and the Ceases and the Pratts and, and all of them. I'll forget some of them, so I'll stop there. The Lutz, they've been there forever and ever. And, and so I thank the Lord for the team of people. See, I love to serve in youth ministry. Call the office and sit down with the pastor and, and find out where your heart's at and how that can fit. The investors in the golden years, right, Pam? which means that you're still 50-ish, so there you go. What a group. And their fellowship and their time in the Word, their time together is always, as I mentioned earlier, about their Thanksgiving dinner. Ten years it happened. It started back in October, I believe, of 2010. They were first time of getting together. So just be reminded that there is much going on on Sunday mornings. There's right now a Sunday group that's going on um, at 10.30 in the cafe. So the investors have been getting together at 9 o'clock. There's also a Bible study time at 10.30 here, over here, uh, sort of all kinds of ages. Young and old people are spending time in Bible study and fellowship right now. So again, behind the scenes, we give thanks for all those that say, hey, there's something very, very important, and that's to teach the Word of God when we have a chance to come together for discipleship, for fellowship, for ministry, for worship, for all the pieces and parts that a church is supposed to have. And then with one more quick slide, I don't know why Mindy took this picture. I'm, a I'm asking myself a question right now, and uh, you can imagine, I don't, I don't have any answer for myself. I, uh, gosh, that's so, and then I chose to put it in the slideshow. Why did I leave it in there? I don't even know. Colossians chapter number three. Over the next few minutes, I, I would like to just take you through these few verses. I'm going to review for you a little bit, give you a, a quick overview and review of verses 12 through 14 as we are reminded of the principle that last week, hey, God's restoring the body and we're praising God because he's doing it. And we mentioned the idea that God's grace restores things. So Colossians chapter number 3 Let's pick it up there in verse number 14. Excuse me, verse number 12, chapter number 3. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Believers, as the elect of God, 
You're the elect in his church, the body of Christ, after salvation. That's how you become elect. It doesn't happen before you're saved. It happens once you're saved, when you're put into the body of Christ. Holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Did you put on these when you put your clothes on today? Put on, because this is something for the believer. Verse number 13 says, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against you, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all, verse 14, you know that when you see that verse, that type of phraseology, and above all, it's like whatsoever or furthermore. It just brings your attention. So, as it says, and above all, these things put on charity. So above everything, put on charity. It'd be like the coach at halftime or before the, uh, before the game or, hey, this is the most important thing today. This is the most important thing we need to do. Above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. When I think of what God has done and continues to do in this passage of Scripture, I, I, I just, I'm just so thankful that grace from God has restored so much in our body over the last few months. And I showed you lots of pictures last week of different places that God was doing things, especially in people's relationships with him and through our relationship with one another. Spending time studying the word of God, spending time getting together in preaching services. Basically, this is a quick overview. God's grace restores our heart with mercy. So that's what we covered last week. We said, hey, there's things that happen here. And so I want you to see where God still is in the restoring business. And the first thing I saw in this passage in verse number 12 that we brought to light is that, hey, there's these bowels of mercy, which means that deep down inside, from the insides, he restores our heart with mercy. He then, speaking of kindness, God restores, God's grace restores our words with kindness. And you see that kindness. Well, what kind of words do you use? Do you use kind words? We mentioned Mephibosheth and how David restored his relationship with the house of Saul by doing something for the grandson of Saul, Jonathan's son, and gave him words of kindness. It says there also, too, something about being humble. Humbleness of mind. God's grace restores our mind with humility. Now, when you look in the scriptures and see all that's spoken of in pride, there's also much to be spoken about humility as well in the word of God. And we see that God's grace restores our mind with humility. I'm supposed to have a humble mind. That's where it starts right here. Men ought to think, women ought to think, we, the Bible says, ought to think as we are. We sometimes are full of ourselves, and it gets right here where my pride gets a hold of me in my mind. I need a humbleness of mind. Then, of course, also it says in verse 12 that God's grace restores our deeds with meekness. Very, very important to be reminded that meekness is such, such a powerful trait because it's power under control. It's where you don't have to execute overall your position of power but rather say i'm going to let the holy spirit of god work as i go to my knees and i bow my heart lord god work through me or work through someone else work through your promises in the word meekness stand down sometimes stand up for the things you need to stand up for but be meek in those situations where you think you need to manipulate things the Bible's telling me that God's grace restores our deeds with meekness. Our deeds ought to have a meek spirit to them. And I heard that it has something to do with the fruit of the spirit as well. And then I saw a fifth thing there in verse number 12, the long-suffering part. God's grace restores our ministry with long-suffering. If you're going to minister to other people, you need to have a long-suffering, ministering heart. You need to say, I will suffer along and work through things, and I will wait on you, Lord. Paul taught us that as he was long-suffering to this church and to the church at Corinth, to the church at Ephesus, 
He was a long-suffering example as an apostle. And then in verse number 13, two things. We saw that God's grace restores our resolve with forbearing. I have to have a resolve to forbear, to withstand. I also have to have God's grace restore my person, the person I am in Jesus Christ, not my great little pile of prideful self-esteem, but rather the esteem I have in Jesus Christ where he has forgiven me. So we forgive because he has forgiven us. We know the scriptures say a lot about forgiveness. And so it was Paul saying, put on what? This forgiveness. If any man have a quarrel against you, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Let him do that in you. God's grace restores our person with forgiving. I wonder how many people have a difficult time with forbearing and forgiving and allowing God's grace to restore their spirit of forgiveness. And then 14, as a review, God's grace restores our unity with charity. That really is the bond, of course, of peace. It puts us back together. And it shows us, as we're going to see here in a little bit, about how that unity comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Colossians 3 gave us a lot of reminders. And so that was just a quick review for a few minutes How easily do God's people forget that he is doing it? Sometimes, with remembering all the things that we remember, we forget what God is doing. So, God has compelled me, as your pastor, to remind you, remind me, remind us together that God is restoring the body principle in his local church. And that's what he does. So today we look at verses 15, 16, 17. Let's read these and look at a couple questions and then see God's practical truth from each one of these verses. What makes it so easy to take God for granted and lose our attitude of gratitude? Well, these three verses will give us stuff to show us how to get that attitude of gratitude back a little bit. Here we go. Verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. I don't know if we have to go any further. Okay. To the which also ye are called in one body and be be thankful. By the way, thankfulness or being thankful or giving thanks is mentioned in the book of Colossians as much as any book. I think it's six, seven times it's a reference to being thankful. Verse number 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. It says dwell. Dwell, we'll get into there in a minute. Dwell in you richly, like a treasure. Teaching and admonishing one another. So he says about the word of Christ to dwell in you. But then in this, as a combo package, he says, Oh yeah, by the way, Teaching and admonishing through what? Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We'll get into that here in a moment. Verse 17. Many of you know this verse. Why do you do what you do? And whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Paul's big on making sure that he states Jesus Christ a lot. He's to be preeminent. He is to have the most important spot, the first place spot on why I do what I do and how I do what I do. So what's, why is it so easy to lose this attitude of gratitude? Let me, let me just ask you something on the other side and see if you'd agree with this as we jump into it. Why does the effort of let's give thanks have such a great effect on us? We know if we're thankful, it just changes our mood. Well, let's just go the other way. When you're not thankful, 
here usually a miserable fill in the blank. I don't have anything to be thankful for. Oh, you don't? Hmm. So let's stay on this side because it says, whatsoever. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all. And we're to give thanks. So, the effort. We have to take effort. This is, this is what we're going to do for the next few minutes. We're really going to make some effort. We've already taken a few minutes and make some effort. Let's make some effort. And I believe it will have a better effect on you and me. Because I will be thankful. I mean, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, concerning me. So, when Paul the Apostle says, hey, this is what I put before you, you and I need to grab a handle on it. We'll be into Colossians chapter number 3 in a couple of Wednesdays after we finish up 2. And I'll remind it, boy, verse by verse, that Paul the Apostle really kind of covered every spot, every little place that the church needed to be reset, rebooted, revived, just re. So here's our first verse, verse number 15. And I've, if you'd like to take notes, I've got a number of uh, support verses, and we'll look up some of them, and for time we'll just see what the Lord gives us for time to do so. Again, verse number 15, be reminded of what it says let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Okay, so that's the first part I want to look at. That's a really, really important statement. The peace of God to rule in your hearts. What does it mean when God's word, excuse me, when the peace of God rules in your heart? We'll get to God's word here in a moment, but the peace of God. Now, there's a lot of different verses that uh, refer to peace in the peace of God and, and looking them up and, and things like that. I put a few extra references up there, but let's just start with this. Let's give thanks for the peace of God. Let it rule in our hearts. Again, I mentioned it last night with a different kind of message, but it's still very, very true. Paul constantly reminded this church and any other church that would listen to his words and letter by the Holy Spirit would you please be thankful for being saved? Would you please realize what happened to you when Jesus Christ saved you? Would you please get a better handle and a better grip on the doctrine of your salvation? I want you to be comforted in knowing that you're saved. I want you to be comforted in many things. And one of the areas in which you need to have comfort over things in your life is that the peace of God can rule in your hearts. Period. Now, people often tell me they're at peace about things. I prayed about it, and I have peace, and so I'm going to make a decision. That's fine. I get that. And that's a good thing. But you see, that's not the only part of really deciding to do what God wants you to do. And by the way, that's a scapegoat way, go, way out. You're just not going to spend more time to find out really what God's will is. You're just going to say, I have a sense of peace about something. Again, that's okay, but you're selling God short. That doesn't mean that you're not, you're not going to make the right decision based on that. But let me just say, beware that you just say, I have a peace about something. God's given me peace. I'm at peace about that. And then you make a decision that really wasn't God's will. Because it didn't really line up with God's word. Even though you had a peace about it. I was reading something in studying for this. It's really neat. Jonah fell asleep in the whale. You think he was at peace with things? He sure was. And it was totally against God's will. Good example. Not bad. I didn't come up with it. I just read somebody else that came up with it. I thought I'd pass it on. Since everybody had been preaching the Bible for a long time, you might as well just hitch up to the things that are in the Spirit of God. And I'm just looking at that. But think of all the others. Think of all the others. Think of the ox cart and how it fell down because they were moving the ox, uh, moving the, uh, the, uh, the ark wrong on the ox. David was fine with that. Oops. Didn't work out right. Then they had to make it right. You see, again, let it rule in your hearts. There's a lot of good verses up there, but if I was to read Ephesians 2.14, it's a reminder for you and me, hey, I... I get it. I, I understand it. For he is our peace who has made both one 
and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Thank you, God, for your peace that has broken down the wall of partition. It says in Philippians 4, 7, the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Verse number 9 says, those things which ye have learned, received, and heard, and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Paul writes a lot about it. Remember, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon were written from his first trip in prison, so there's a lot of similarity and verbiage in the way that things are communicated. Let's give thanks to, for the peace of God and let it rule in our hearts. Also, the second half of the verse says, let's give thanks for the unity of the body. What does he say in there? We are called in one body. Be thankful. Be thankful for being in one body. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number uh, 12 real quick. Some of you are familiar with what this is already when we go there. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. That's the, the chapter that talks about the spiritual gifts. It talks about the things that uh, that church got out of order when it came to the spiritual gifts. And he really broke everything down. But before he does that, Paul says to the church at Corinth... Don't forget about the unity you have in the Spirit. Verse number 12, chapter number 12 of 1 Corinthians. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of the, that body, that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. One, one, one. There's a unity there. Verse number 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Six times. Oh, by the way, let's take a bonus. Verse number 14, for the body is not one member, but many. We are one. Let's give thanks for the unity of the body, right? So we give thanks for God unifying us through the spirit. We are one in the spirit, which then the conclusion is, let it, what? The body be thankful. So we're thankful to God for what he's done to unify us into one. He put us in by Jesus. We're not just like we, we signed up for a club, we paid our dues. We are one by the blood of Jesus Christ. He paid the dues. So in your thinking, okay, now what do I do? Well, why don't you give thanks to all the people around you for being in on what God is doing and let the body be more thankful because of what is, God has done because we're giving thanks for God's unity. He then goes into verse number 16. I found a couple things here that are really neat. Uh, I believe there's, uh, as you're studying it, and you're looking at it, but I see the first part is, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. I referenced that earlier. So that's one of them. And then I see the teaching and the admonitioning, that we would see that admonitioning going on, that, that God shows us that teaching and admonishing. To be admonished is very, very important. So Paul's saying, that you need to let the word of God, the word of Christ, dwell in you richly. A lot of people read the Bible. A lot of people study the Bible. A lot of people teach the Bible. But I wonder if all God's people really let the word of Christ dwell in them richly. Some may say, well, it's hard for me to read or it's hard for me to study. It's hard for me to follow you. It's hard for me. It's hard. It's hard for you to go to work every morning, but boy, if you want your bills to be paid, you'll go, won't you? Seriously? You're going to treat the word of Christ that way? Oh, it's hard for me. Seriously. That's what you're going to return is an attitude of gratitude, of not having gratitude toward the God of glory that saved you, bought with a price. You're not your own. This is the word of God. It's powerful, quicker than sharper than any other two of sword. Get into it and stop asking God to make it easier. If that were the case, he'd have made it easy for his son. But it wasn't, and it need not be. It's a hard walk, and it's a beautiful walk. I just want you to know, if you haven't figured that out yet. So let's give thanks for the word of Christ to dwell in you richly. The chiefs dwell in you, some of you, richly. I told the first service, I got to pass it on to you. I got word they canceled the game today. Did you know that? You didn't know. You didn't hear? I'm just kidding. See, got a lot of you. You're like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do tonight? If you told me you were going to take my Bible away, I'd knock you right out. That would upset me. Yeah. 
What we dwell in is what we live in. So write those verses down. Let me just tell you, Acts, those verses are awesome. I just started messing around with them. When, you know what, Acts number six, verse number seven, you know what happened when the disciples got the word of God out? Woohoo! The word of God increased. The number of disciples multiplied. Verse number 24 of chapter number 12, the word of God grew and multiplied. It didn't mean they got a bigger King James Bible. It means that it grew in influence. It grew in effectiveness. It grew because the power of God resides here. And when you dwell in it, it dwells in you. Let it rule over you. Let it have its way with you, and it'll be sweet. You say, well, I'm a little bit lunatic. I know. I've had to learn these lessons the hard way. Believe me, just like you. But it's okay to learn them hard, because when you learn them in the hard way, you usually grasp a hold of them a lot better when you, than when you get them easy. People say, how in the world do you have some solutions to problem? It's because I made all the mistakes worse than you ever dreamed of. That's why I got slices and cuts all over my hands, because I wouldn't listen to my father-in-law in the shop. I used to go to the emergency room every year. Gosh, praise the Lord. It says in verse number 20 of chapter number 19, so mightily grew the word of God and prevail. It grew and it grew and it grew and it reached people and it changed people and it discipled people and that's what it'll do in you. Well, we could spend an hour and a half on that, so let's just move on to the next couple. We have a few minutes to go. Just hang in there with me. Let's give thanks for the teaching and admonishing of the singing. You say, no, that's the teaching. No, that's the singing. You see in verse number 16, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. Do you know what you do when you're singing beautiful songs to the Lord? Even with Bobby's beautiful voice? The definition of a psalm, a hymn, and a spiritual song. A psalm is a striking twangy of a striking the instruments of a musical, a striking chords of a musical instrument. That's the word psalm in your Strong's Concordance. The word hymn, a song in tithe praise of God's heroes and conquerors, a sacred song. It says also that a song in your Strong's Concordance is a ode. A chant or an ode. So, a psalm or a hymn or a spiritual song, you know what it does? It allows you to teach and admonish other people with your heart for the Lord. You admonish me. You exhort me and you warn me. Paul said at the end of Colossians chapter number 1 that he is going to preach, warn, and teach all men. And so admonishing warns people, but with song, with song. I wonder if the songs of today, with so many of them that are written, I'm not mad about, I just, I'm not, so many of them, this is the conflict, they're written about, or they're written for you instead of being written for the Lord. So I wonder if the teaching and admonishing really is being done. I doubt it. But when you sing a song that's from the book of Psalms, or from anywhere that God's written it, or just a song that's written to glorify God, oh boy, it teaches and admonishes others. And then verse number 17 has one little thought. This is beautiful. Again, the simplicity of God's word is always very difficult to follow. I say it often. I even said it last night in our message. And whatsoever, <laughs> whatsoever you do, here's that whatsoever word. So whatsoever is going to be the Lord's Supper in about two or three minutes here. It's the whatsoever today. And we think, okay, let's give thanks for the whatsoever. Because some people get really mad at the whatsoever that God gives you to do. And then you get mad and complain, about, I don't want to do the whatsoever. And God says, whatsoever you do, in word or deed, let it all be in Jesus' name. Let it all be. 1 Corinthians 10. That everything you would do would be for the glory of God. Let's turn it around a little bit, church. If you're not, and if you are, keep on doing it. Because the whatsoever stuff that we have is for God's glory. Look at verse number 23. Right down, right down there, Colossians 3, verse 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not to men. I'm doing it to please the Lord. When you say that and you mean that without a tongue in your cheek, you know what you're saying? The name of Christ 
is whose name I want to give credit to, I want to give thanks to, I want to give praise to, I want to give acknowledgement to, I want to draw attention to the name of Jesus because I'm only here because of Jesus Christ. I'm not here for anybody else. I'm not here for any other. Now, I appreciate all of you, and I'm here for you, but preeminently, I'm here for Jesus Christ. That's his name. I'm here preaching because of him. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't even do it. I wouldn't even waste my time. But I do it because I love Jesus Christ. And it's his name. I'll work my rear end up because of his name. And you do the same. Because you encourage me. And when you sing those songs, you admonish me and everybody else. And you teach everybody else. But let's give thanks for the whatsoever that he gives you to do. Because he might have you clean out some stuff in your life that you don't want to, but you do it in Jesus' name. You do it for his name. Let it all be for Jesus' name. As we pray together here, before we take the Lord's Supper, I just want you to consider the examination that God always wants you and I to make. And we don't do it enough, but right now we're going to do it together. You do it in your own quiet time, I'll do it in my own quiet time as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper. When you come up to get the elements, you come down that aisle away, you come down that aisle away, you go and you leave and you exit against the wall side, you take the time to pray. You take the time to examine yourself. You take the time to say, God, search me, oh God, and know my heart. See if there be anything that is troubling, wicked, or wrong in me to be dealt with. So let's give thanks while we remember what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. Our Father in heaven, we should come to you in this Lord's Supper time as we pray and acknowledge who you are. We do it whatsoever we do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other name. He is the name. You are the name. You are the reason. And I thank you for that. So we give thanks to you in the name of Jesus. And as we, God, gather together around the communion table, we pray that you will be exalted, honored, and glorified. We remember what you've done, Jesus, and we examine ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen.